are most people even capable of pushing that hard? And because uh, because I want to bring it back to where we were a, minimum, a moment ago, which was, hey, for a person who just wants to train 30 minutes twice a day, they can get all the benefit in the, in the world. But there's an asterisk there, right? Which is that 30 minutes twice a week is going to be the most difficult 60 minutes total of your week. Mm -hmm. So going back to Dorian for a second, you know, what is what has to be true to be able to only train that much in terms of total hours, volume, however you want to measure it? How much work needs to be done in that window of time? For the, uh, not the Dorian Yates example. For no, the... for the Dorian. Let's start with Dorian. Like why, why could he produce such a massive physique? And, and again, let's just normalize all the drugs. We're going to talk about drugs later. So we'll, we'll explain where the drugs are and aren't helping. But all the drugs in the world aren't going to give you that physique if you can't mm. generate the the destruction of the muscle like yeah. is that just the sort of thing where virtually nobody can actually push that hard that consistently or was it just that nobody thought to do it the way he was doing it at the time plenty of people thought that's how it works mike menser did that only in a more extreme version than even dorian did lots of menser acolytes did it it's not the most efficient or the most effective way to train but it is quite effective because if you go very close to failure with very heavy loads all of the subcomponents of your musculature, your motor units, which is the motor neuron and all of the cells that it uh, activates, they'll get recruited and they will be asked to work to their limits. They'll take on a great deal of damage and disruption. They'll sense a ton of tension and they'll produce great results for you. The other thing is that the relationship between both intensity and volume of how much you do work in the gym, especially volume, is curvilinear and hyperbolic. So it looks like this. And if people are just listening to this, it means if you do one all out hard set per muscle group per week, which is not what Dorian did, no. he did roughly 14 of those per yep. week per muscle group, um, you get maybe something like 30% of what you could have gotten with five sets. But Why that is that? Doesn't Because your body has very good sensing mechanisms for tension and metabolites and all these other things that cause muscle growth. And when it detects that you're pushing on the pedal, it'll give you a real good wallop of result. You keep pushing on the same pedal over and over, and the systems are greatly desensitized to giving you more muscle growth. Mm. The biggest reason that is, is probably because the human body is attuned and evolved almost entirely in, um, hundreds of millions of years before we were even human of what is in the modern context called food insecurity. And so in order to make a real good case for allocating that much to muscle growth, you're going to have to have a real distinct signal to ask your body to put more and more into that process. So it kind of auto caps itself. If you are myostatin deficient, then actually just existing, you just grow muscle all sure. the time. So it seems to be that for a variety of reasons, including that one, that if you do one set close to failure, you get a lot of gains. You do three sets close to failure, you get substantially more gains, but not three times as many gains. Yes. You do five sets close to failure and you do just a little bit better than three. You do seven or eight sets close to failure in one workout and it's statistically undifferentiable from five. So that's kind of how that chart looks. So Dorian, from what I understand, did roughly 14 sets per week per muscle group-ish. And um, that gets into that territory of a very robust signal of growth to the muscle. It's not the highest signal of growth. If you decided not to train your legs very hard or your back very hard, and the amount of systemic fatigue that's imparted to you week by week is much lower, because fatigue isn't just local, it spills over into everything else, you could push your arms, shoulders, and chest not to 14 or 15 or 20 sets per week, but in many cases, 25, 30, 35 sets per week and experience very meaningful growth enhancements that you would never have seen only ever training those 15 sets a week. But 15 sets a week might bring you to 70 or 85% of what all of those muscles could eventually have hypertrophied if you only ever specialized in them. And so Dorian was insanely jacked, but he was jacked all over and probably could have in retrospect benefited from more specialization phases on various weak points that he had. 
His back was startling. His arms were excellent. Now, by mortal standards, they were the biggest arms you've ever seen in your life. By competitive bodybuilders of his era standards, relative to the rest of his physique, he could have had bigger arms, could have bigger shoulders. And so he could have poured much more volume into those muscle groups and lessened everything else. But Dorian seemed to have a kind of all around approach, which up until about a year ago, so did I. And so I had never looked very aesthetic, but boy, were my legs super big because they could just eat up the growth all the time. So if you want to do not a ton of volume for any one muscle, if you work really hard and bring yourself very close to failure, you can already do super, super well just with that alone. If you get a really good cook, someone who really knows how to make food, and you give them an hour in the kitchen with a variety of menu items versus three hours, within an hour, they can wow you with what you're eating. Within three, they can wow you more, but it's not three times more like, uh, you know, matrix reloaded orgasmic brownie or whatever. They ain't gonna make that. There's going to take them a lot longer than three hours. They can make a difference, but probably only people who are very culinarily attuned can tell. Like if he, if someone makes me chicken fingers, gourmet chicken fingers, if there's such a thing, I'm sure Austin has something like that. Um, then, you know, an hour versus three to me, it all tastes same, same. It's amazing to someone really, really with a refined palate, they'll be able to tell, but they can't lie to you and say, look, this three hour chicken finger, this is just categories above the one hour one. So in a lot of processes in general, and luckily in the human body, getting some of the way to your body's maximum ability to recover actually brings you most of the way as far as results. And that's why Dorian could do what he did. Now, if Dorian was doing 14 sets per body part per week, um, would that mean 14 sets to failure of 14 different exercises so we're not counting the warm-up sets and things of that nature? It's a complex question. It's not 100% clear exactly what Dorian did or if he even did everything exactly as it was written on paper all the time. Mm -hmm. You see his training videos. You don't always see just one set. He would also have this thing like a warm-up set that for him was a warm up, but for most people would absolutely be a work set. Right, right. So it may be more like two or three equivalents of a working set per yeah, exercise. Yeah, sort of maybe three like, or maybe, maybe there's there. like a total throwaway set, and then there's, you know, a modest set, and then there's a two rep in reserve set that, again, that's a real working set. Sure, which and then for there's him a set to failure. Right, yes. Yeah. So according to his categorization, the only work set was the one that was absolutely to true muscular failure, sometimes with forced repetitions, which you would also have to integrate because forced reps is when someone helps you lift the rest of the weight, or if you do a drop set, yeah. you use less weight right after you went to failure. We shouldn't count that as just one set. Yep. Uh, it wouldn't be the most correct way to think about it. So. And when you compare that to the example of the three-hour chef, so now the person who's willing to put in 30 sets per body part per week, do any of those sets need to be to failure or are you counting those as, hey, these would be sets of two reps in reserve, one to two reps in reserve? Almost all of the literature that has found out that if you don't systemically fatigue the whole body too much, any given muscle or several muscles you can push into the 30, 40, 50 plus set range per week. Almost every single study done to elucidate that understanding was done with uh, muscular failure studies, true failure. Truer failure than you'll see in the gym because these people are training in laboratory conditions with master students screaming at them to keep going. Most of us have never trained that hard consistently. Yeah. So people can still recover. Now, these are undergraduates. Um, that are recreationally trained typically, so they can neither do a lot of damage, um, nor are they impeded by age and prior injury and all this other thing. So I would say that whatever amount of sets you have to do to get a certain amount of, whatever amount of growth you want, you can get there in a few different ways. You can get there with, let's say, 30 sets that are four reps shy of failure, you can get there with 22 sets that are one or two reps shy of failure, and you can get there with 20 sets that are all the way to absolute muscular failure. So if you are really training not so super hard for reps in reserve, you'll have to do substantially more sets to see the same hypertrophy. But study after study after study illustrates that when you're getting one or two reps away from failure, it is often statistically undifferentiable on raw growth than going all the way to failure. However, the fatigue of true failure training, probably mostly because of that nervous system component, 
is exponentially higher. And so as far as an efficiency and long-term sustainability strategy, training all the way to muscular failure every session as a matter of principle is probably on the margin suboptimal and you should probably, most of your sessions should be one or two reps in reserve. Like if you're doing dumbbell presses, you think you finished your last rep and you're like, gun to my head, I could do one or two more, but that's it. Most times it's probably best to stop at that point because what you're getting if you go north of that is a 10 to one fatigue to stimulus ratio. Whereas everything before was like one to one, two to one, three to one, five to one, and all of a sudden it's 10 to one. It's a lot of fatigue cost to pay for what in the literature chronically ends up being either tiny, tiny bit better or not better at all. Which says nothing of the risk of injury when you drop that dumbbell on your pec, which I don't know anybody that's done that, but I've been told it really hurts when you fail in a set of dumbbell presses oh, and boy. totally collapse Just with, avoid a, your head. with a dumbbell on your pec that turns black and blue. Oh, good God. Yeah. yeah I would that, never know that. All, all sorts of things. I just like to aim for the genitals at that point. <laughs> Might as well have a cool story. But uh, yeah, the training to failure, the vast proportion of people that really proposed that training to failure is somehow special for results, they didn't reason their way into that. They emoted their way into that. Training to failure is something the 13 to 19 year old you would have really found a lot of spirit energy in, as I like to say. It's um, adult male putting on his hat of, I'm a mountain goat and I run into shit. <laughs> That's what I do. I saw an adorable video of uh, uh, some folks that own a few goats and a few dogs and the, there's, their pit bull is like, hi not hiding, but sitting under this like little thing. And there's like a, a teenage goat that's looking at him and he jumps up on his hind legs and tries to like hit him in the head and the pit bull backs up and he's like, ah. and the goat just tries to do that again. He's just trying to get it on. Like he just wants to hit stuff. That's all he wants. And so when you're a young male, when you are prone to wanting success for yourself, you're the type of sort of type A personality that wants to look back on their life. And if you had to roll the dice and say, the reason you weren't optimally successful is that you work too hard, they'd be like, ah, sweet, whatever, that's kind of cool. But if, if they saw the dice roll and say, well, the reason you weren't optimally successful in life is because you didn't work hard enough, they would not live with themselves. Those kinds of folks generally tend to go to muscular failure for just that, like the spirit energy. It feels right, damn it. And it feels good and it's um purifying almost at a, an existential level to be able to have given something you're all in the face of challenge, in the face of injury risk, in the face of grotesque pain. And you know this from sport experience, when you're really, really tired, your whole existence is screaming at you to stop. Ignoring those things and going all the way until you know you've pushed it as far as your body can go, there's something very magical there for the soul. For results in the gym, there's not much magical there, but you have to get close to it. You just don't have to go all the way. Thank you.